While Brexit may have taken a backseat role to COVID in the last 12 to 14 months, it doesn't mean that it went away. It still very much happened, and there are still many implications that came with it, especially to trade with the UK. We are both delighted and grateful to be joined today by Mary White, who has been head of the NSAI Brexit unit since March 2019. In her current role, Mary works in partnership with the Department of Enterprise, Trade and Employment, as well as various other government departments and state agencies to mitigate the impact for Irish businesses in terms of examining and communicating the impacts of Brexit on the standards and certification of products and services. She serves on the department's coordination Brexit committee and has been part of their team delivering the Brexit messages while in 2020, she represented Ireland at the European Standards Brexit meetings with the EU task force negotiating team regarding the impact of Brexit on standards and trade. So who better to have with us today to explain the changes to the regulatory requirements when they become effective and the implications to supply chain brought about by Brexit. Welcome, Mary. It's great to have you here. Good morning, uh, uh, Gary. Thank you very much. We are now 141 days in adjusting to trade with the UK as a third country, and manufacturers are the backbone of the supply chain. Today, I want to give you an insight as to what is involved in product regulatory requirements, the changes that have taken place since uh, January uh, the 1st, and the implications for the supply chain when trading with the UK. CE marking is a legal requirement for placing products on the EU market to demonstrate that they conform to the relevant EU directives and regulations regarding health and safety. Now, I want to focus on the changes that have taken place since the 1st of January and what adjustments you may have to make whether you're buying components from GB or selling a finished product to Great Britain. So what has happened since the 1st of January? Well, the transition period ended and trade and cooperation agreement came into, into operation. The UK became a third country where EU law no longer applies. UK product uh, law now applies in Great Britain rather than in the EU. UK notified bodies are no longer recognized in the EU and UCAS accredited certificates are not valid for harmonized products. And the protocol in Ireland, Northern Ireland has come into effect. Now, what hasn't changed is that EU regulations directives still apply to products from the UK placed on the EU market. And they must be CE marked if required by EU rules. Manufacturer must use an EU 27 notified body if required by EU legislation and have a valid EU declaration of conformity for industrial products and a valid declaration of performance for construction products. And by a declaration of conformity, I mean the technical file that the manufacturer must have, which would include all various test results that he would have gathered in de developing the product. So self and self-certification by UK manufacturers is still allowed. Now self-certification in terms of CE marking accounts for 80% of CE marked products on the market. And what I would also like to bring your attention to is that the Irish building regulations applies to products used in Irish construction projects. And that uh, has significance when uh, products are imported from the UK. Now in terms of Northern Ireland, well, the protocol uh, protects the Good Friday Agreement, North-South Cooperation and the All-Island Economy. It, this is applied since the 1st of January and it avoids the need for a hard border on the island of Ireland and it protects Ireland's place in the EU single market and customs union. Now most of the changes applying to trade with GB do not apply to trade with Northern Ireland and EU product legislation will continue to apply in Northern Ireland. It means that goods moving to and from Northern Ireland will largely continue to do so with no significant changes. So this is how the EU system operates. Um, in the first instance, the EU drafts regulations and directives which break down barriers to trade to facilitate the free movement of products. And the obligations and responsibilities lie with the manufacturers, importers and distributors. So standards and technical specification show how you meet the requirement. And in terms of standards, they, they are harmonized standards and, you can, and there are technical specifications which are voluntary. 
Now, third party certification, you may or may not be familiar with. This demonstrates that your product meets the requirements of the regulate, regulation and directive where required. And the EU have an agreed framework of notified bodies in Europe, and there are 1300 notified bodies across Europe. Now, once the manufacturer, uh, the declaration has been drawn up by the manufacturer, it, he must have fixed a CE mark to the product. And this CE marking enables a product to be placed legally, legally on the market of EU and then be traded in the EU's single market. And finally, uh, the, the market surveillance are there are checks to ensure that the products placed on the market comply with the requirements of the regulation and directive. Um, in terms of standards and regulations, as you can see there, the EU regulations, they're mandatory. But in order for them to be enforced, they, uh, they are the technical requirements. They are assisted uh, by, by the manufacturer um, manufacturing a product to a harmonized standard. That, and then that demonstrates uh, conformity to the directive. And this can be achieved either by self-certification or uh, it can be done by a third party uh, certification performed by a conformity assessment body known as a notified body. And accreditation in Ireland is controlled by the Irish National Accreditation Board. So there are five overarching pieces of EU legislation for placing products on the market. And there is legislation for specific products. Now, the, uh, the General Product Safety Directive, this applies to all products where there are no specific provisions in other EU legislation with the same object objective, such as the Low Voltage Directive. But the Regulation 765, it's a very important regulation. It lays down common rules for accrediting bodies that ensure products in the EU conform to certain requirements. It establishes a surveillance system to guarantee a high level of safety of those products, and in general, their compliance with applicable requirements. It also sets rules in regard to control on imports from outside the EU and establishes the general principles for CE marking. And Regulation 1025, this establishes rules with regard to the cooperation between the EU and European standards organizations and the, the establishment of European standards for, for products to support union legislation and policies. And these standards are known as harmonized standards. So it means that a European standard is adopted on the basis of a request made by the Commission for the application of union harmonization legislation. Regulation 768 covers the market surveillance and compliance of products. And then the last regulation there aims to improve how the free movement of goods principles works by strengthening market surveillance of products covered by EU harmonization. So here you see a list of all the regulations and directives. There are 32 in all for industrial products. There are 10 regulations. And of specific interest is number 12 there, which is for the construction products regulation. And I would like to draw your attention then to number 29 and 30, which are the regulation for medical devices, because next week they come into force, uh, which will be replacing the medical device directives. So we have 22 directives. And there are, uh, there are three that I'm going to focus on in my talk today, because I would like to uh, focus a little bit on the uh, machinery directive. So the, uh, the machinery directive was first brought into force in 2006. And there are 162 EU notified bodies that can offer third party certification to the machinery directive within the EU. And there are two notified bodies now in Ireland. And there are 1,168 harmonized standards supporting the machinery directive. As you are well aware, uh, technology is rapidly changing where the machines may have a USB port or be remotely operated. So like a robot, as you see in the standard here, ISEN ISO 10218. Now, this means that they have to be certified under all three directives uh, and also maybe the low voltage directive. And, self, and I've listed these, the number of notified bodies here for these directives. Um, in terms of a declaration of conformity, you only need one declaration of conformity if you are working under three directives. In Ireland, the HSA are the notifying authority and are also responsible for market surveillance. So in 2019, there was an evaluation conducted uh, on the directive to see if it is still fit for purpose. 
And during the evaluation, a poll was conducted to see how effective is the directive. And here's a summary of the findings, uh, which uh, demonstrate that 73% of those polled say that CE marking is a recognized quality certificate also outside the EU. And it is that 94% state one standardization procedure instead of 28 individual standards saves time and money. And 88% say the existence of harmonized European standards saves time in finding appropriate technical specification. So if you wish to place um, a robot on the EU market, you must comply with the machinery directive. The standard that demonstrates that the robot meets the direct directive is ISEN um, 10218 uh, parts one and two. Now, the reason that I am mentioning this standard is that Andrew Lynch and MNR and IMR established a National Robotics Committee back in 2016 with three subcommittees, including a standards subcommittee. At the same time, the standard was been revised to take into account the use of cobots, and that is a human working with a robot. Now, several Irish companies have contributed to the revision of the standard, and Ken Horn from IMR was one of seven Irish delegates attending international standings meetings uh, conducted by the ISO, facilitated through the NSCI and Robotics Standards Subcommittee. So, you can see here, there are again 162 EU notified bodies for the machinery directive and two in Ireland. Now, in 2017, NSAI established an Advanced Manufacturing Standards Committee, and to date there are three subcommittees uh, for IoT, Additive Manufacturing and Robotics, and the IMR are, uh, work very closely on these committees. So the revision of uh, the standard has taken place over the last three years, and there is now a draft out for comment, and my colleague Fergal Finn now manager of standards business development has produced a sectoral report of standards in manufacturing and are working with the IMR in rolling out a standards program and I'm no doubt you're going to hear more about that in the coming months. Um, so here's just a sample of some products that must be C marked. Here you've got your socket with a USB connector. Now that has to be certified by a notified body under the EMC directive because there is a USB connector. A smoke alarm as strangely enough, can be um, a, it comes under the directive of the radio equipment directive that requires to be third party certified. A very good Irish manufacturer down in Shannon makes the smoke alarm, but there are also plenty who are imported. And then finally, we have the face mask, which you, we've all got to have to get used to over the last 14 months, and they have to be certified. Now, there's no Irish manufacturer in Ireland for, for masks, uh, there are a lot more manufactured in France. I'm now going to describe the Irish roadmap in terms of roles and responsibilities for notified bodies. And in the first instance, all the notified bodies are registered on the EU NANDO database. So I just talk you through the slide here. Here's the roadmap and the players involved and their roles. So on the left hand side here, INAB is the Irish national accreditation body for all notified bodies in Ireland. And above it are the notifying authorities. So for medical device, you've got the HPRA. So if you want to become a notified body, you'd have to go through the HPRA. And NSAI is a notified body for medical devices. DETE, COMREG, so COMREG will look after EMC and the Radio Equipment Directive. And then the Department of Housing would look after the Construction Building Products Regulation. There are now 17 notified bodies in Ireland. And in 2018, there were only three. Um, and they've all come in from the UK. So I'll be showing the slide in a different context later on in my presentation. And you can see on the right hand side, here are all the market surveillance authorities in Ireland. So in the top left hand corner, you've got the National Building Control Office, and um, you've got uh, CCPC, uh, you've got the HSA there, among others. So this is a, a, a very important slide, I believe, in my presentation, because it outlines the roles of the economic operators. It shows the difference between the manufacturer, the uh, importer, and the, and the distributor. And firstly, you can see the manufacturer's main responsibilities. He is the one who sets out the declaration of conformity and CE marking, and he must keep the documentation for 10 years and uh, ensure consistent uh, production. Now, up until the end of December, a lot of companies would have been Irish distributors for the manufacturers 
uh, if they had been dealing with the UK. However, now they have taken on additional role. If they are dealing with a UK manufacturer, they by default, they have become uh, an, an importer for the manufacturer and they have to have their importer details on the packaging. And while some while distributors have fewer responsibilities than the manufacturers or importers, um, they also have to have a, a paperwork available uh, for market surveillance purposes. In terms of the UK, well, the UK, they put in place a new legal framework for product certification, whereby UK legislation replaced the EU legislation. So they just transposed EU law into UK law. And that uh, it applies only to products in Great Britain, that is England, Scotland and Wales. Now, the protocol on Northern Ireland means that uh, this does not generally apply to the Northern Ireland market. And UK product legislation is similar to EU product legislation. The UK mark replaces the CE mark. You may have heard about this already. UK approved bodies replace EU notified bodies. So all previously UK notified bodies, there were 167 of them, were removed from the Nando database. UK designated standards replace harmonized standards and the UK Declaration of Conformity replaces the EU uh, Declaration of Conformity and UK customers of EU manufacturers become importers. So as I mentioned in a previous slide, what is very important in the EU is Regulation 765. Its equivalent in Great Britain is the UK Statutory Instrument Product and Safety Metrology Amendment Schedule uh, uh, done in 2019. So again, just to reinforce the point in the EU, we talk about harmonized standards. In Great Britain, it's designated standards. In the EU, we talk about notified bodies. In the UK, it's now approved bodies. And we have the CE mark in Europe. And in the UK, it's the UK CA mark. Now, Northern Ireland, yes, there are more uh, additions here. Well, uh, I'm just going to introduce the new mark that may be used to place products on the Northern Ireland market only. And Article 7 of the protocol includes provision for manufacturers in Northern Ireland who do not want to CE mark the products for the EU, but who still want to sell in Northern Ireland. They are the normal EU product certification marks with the UK and I mark placed and for certain other uh, for industrial products. And uh, but you must in Northern Ireland, you, must, you still must comply with EU legislation and harmonize standards. But the caveat is that they have to be certified by UK notified bodies. Now, there are four uh, Northern Ireland notified bodies at the moment. And the CE mark um, it, that would be used is uh, for, for Northern Ireland is, can only be used in Northern Ireland. It cannot be used on the EU market or on the Irish market. Um, and any products... Um, you do not need to actually need this new UK, uh, UK, or CE UK and I mark if your products are already CE marked, as if you're a manufacturer in Northern Ireland, they will also be recognised uh, in Great Britain. So in terms of Northern Ireland, like I showed similarly, uh, they can use the UK CA mark, they can also use the CE UK and I mark, but they must use EU legislation under Regulation 765, harmonised standards and notified bodies. So they are the changes and the introduction of the new marks. Now I want to talk about, we talked about uh, the UK acceptance of CE marking. We've heard the word transition period and there is a transition period for the CE marking. So the UK product legislation has been applied in Great Britain since the 1st of January. Um, and the CE mark for industrial products is accepted in Great Britain until the 31st of December. However, there were updates and modifications for two directives in particular in February, and the Marine Directive and the TPED Directive, which is the Transporter Pressure Equipment, will recognize the CE mark until 2022. Um, they all, if you are as going placing your product on the U, uh, UK market, you can still have a UK declaration of conformity and, and it can be done by an EU notified body and you must use harmonized standards. However, once the UK transition period is over, then uh, the CE mark is no longer accepted in Great Britain. Um, so just to uh, give, give you a flavor here, we talked about the machinery directive and these are where there's possibly are going to be divergences. So the EU work program for 2021 is a Europe fit for the digital age. 
and they are going to revise the machinery directive and they're evaluating the EMC directive. Now, what this means is that should those there be changes, the UK uh, equivalent of the machinery directive in Britain will not necessarily follow the changes of what the EU uh, provide. And that also uh, applies to any other regulation and directive. In particular for UK, uh, for the medical devices, all CE marking is valid until the 30th of June, 2023. The UK mark has been valid since 2021. And then by the 1st of July, 2023, if you're an Irish manufacturer placing a medical device on the UK market, you will have to use uh, the uh, UK uh, CA mark. Now this, that legislation is the UK medical device regulation. So from, from, the, from now on in the UK, they will only use these three directives that I listed previously, uh, and they, you have to have them certified by a UK approved body, and that is from the 1st of July. Um, however, uh, the MDR and the IVDR directive will not apply in Great Britain, and as I mentioned earlier, this applies from the 26th of May, which is next week. Um, so the, these are the two regulations that come into force for, the, for all of Europe. So here you can see, and it also applies in Northern Ireland, here you will see already the regulatory divergence. Now, in terms of UK conformity assessment, here is a roadmap for the UK. So you will see here um, that the accreditation body in the UK is UPAS. Uh, the notifying authority for medical devices is the MHRA, and the notifying authority for a lot of certification is UCAS. And here are the English companies who are already in Ireland. These are the 14 notified bodies, and the top three are BSI, SGS, and UL. They're, not, they're sorry, approved bodies uh, for medical devices. So there are fewer players in the medical device world uh, in terms of approved bodies. And instead of NANDO, we have the UK Market Conformity Assessment Body. Um, and the market surveillance people are carried out by a number of uh, bodies such as the MHRA and National Trading Standards. So in terms of standards and regulations under the Machinery Directive, they're, uh, the equivalent of our Machinery Directive in Europe is the UK Product Safety uh, Metrology Amendment. The Machinery Safety Regulation was amended in 2019. This is mandatory. Um, you, they would work, they can no longer use um, uh, 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 an EN, say ISO, it has to be a BS. As you can see in Europe, we would call it in Ireland an ISEN. So for harmonized work, you're not allowed in any declaration of performance use the word BS. It would be classified as a non-conformity. So you can see here that these are the standards that have been followed and you've got the U UK conformity assessment certification who issue the UK CA mark. In terms there, you have the UK approved bodies and in terms for the machinery directive, there are 17 UK approved uh, bodies for, on for the machinery directive. Now, if you, uh, my talk really has focused on what you need to know about CE marking if you are a manufacturer, but the regulations and directives continue to apply unchanged in the EU. So assisting Irish companies exporting to Great Britain and Northern Ireland, what mark must I use? Well, in Europe, you still use the uh, CE mark until the end of December, and that continues right on. In Northern Ireland, you can use the CE and the CE UK and I mark. And in Great Britain, you can still use the UK CA mark and the CE mark. However, from the 1st of January next year, you are not allowed to be used the CE mark for what I uh, mentioned earlier. Now, in terms of the supply chain, how will they be impacted? Well, we've got our economic operators, manufacturer, importer, authorized representative. So if you're a manufacturer in Ireland and you're exporting to Great Britain, you will have to have an authorized representative. And it, the same uh, for medical devices, they're known as a responsible uh, person. You're importing into a third country, which is GB. So economic operators exporting into GB, you're the manufacturer, you're, you become the importer. 
and importing products then from Great Britain into Ireland. You will become an importer. And as I said earlier, you take on additional responsibilities. And if you're in the construction sector, please check Article 13 of the Construction Products Regulation. You need to find out additional responsibilities that you're taking on. You need to engage with the manufacturers of the product. And it's our experience that the UK manufacturers are not as knowledgeable as their counterparts in Ireland. You must ensure that you will be able to get the information and assurances that you need so that you don't experience delays at the ports. Uh, you must be able to access the technical required uh, file if required by market surveillance authorities, which will be the Irish market surveillance authorities in Ireland at the ports, uh, right? And your details as an importer must be included in the packaging and product information leaflets. And um, it would be advisable too that if you are importing a product that the declaration of conformity would accompany the component and the product. So in terms of impacting of Brexit, this is a very a useful uh, document as known as the EU notice, notice to stakeholders. It was drafted in March 2020 and um, all economic operators must comply with the op their obligations and, reg and responsibilities under Regulation 765. Both the authorised representatives and importers must be established in the EU 27. And the EU Commission is advising that British standards can no longer be used for product certification where the relevant EU le legis legislation sorry, mandates the use of a harmonised European standards. And where a harmonised European standards are not mandated, manufacturers should follow the requirements set out in the relevant EU product uh, legislation. So British standards are likely to be acceptable where the regulation allows the use of international standards and European standards or national standards from third countries. Um, so the UK accreditation service ceased to be a national accreditation body within the meaning and the purpose of regulation 765. And as I said earlier, all UK notified bodies lost their status as an EU notified body. So if you had been dealing with the, a UK manufacturer who has their product certified by a former uh, notified body in the UK, unless that product had been placed on the market in the UK before the 31st of December, that product would have to be recertified if, it's, if it is now going to be placed on the European market by an EU 27 notified body. Um, so, as I mentioned earlier, it would constitute a form of non-compliance to mention the word BSEN on your DOP or your DOC uh, or for CE marking if the product has been placed on the EU market. Um, another thing that uh, economic operators uh, from GB, since the 1st of January, uh, the manufacturer, uh, when they ship to in Ireland, they become the importer, but the importer, if it redistributes, then becomes the distributor. So that's just a very important piece of information. Um, in terms of wood packaging, you may or not be familiar with wood packaging, but uh, the ISPM sets down, these are what, what would be seen here on the palette. They set down guide standards for the treatment and mar marking of wood packaging material, and these would be pallets, crates, dunnage used in international trade. There are over a million pallets in the UK and the symbol that you must see on the pallet is what is stamped. The stamp must be on all pallets. Uh, the pallet is heat treated to 56 degrees um, and it is important for both importing and exporting your pallets. And they are normally, these pallets are three times the price of uh, non-treated uh, um, pallets. There are uh, 50 uh, Irish pallet manufacturers in Ireland and it's controlled by, um, in Ireland controlled by the Department of Agriculture. And this has come into force under regulation 216. So you, they must meet these requirements. So if you've got a product uh, on a pallet that doesn't have the stamp, I'm sorry, it's going to get stuck in, um, in Dublin port. So finally, if you have any inquiries uh, on part of the helpline at uh, the point of contact, Revenue um, have very good information. Um, my colleague uh, Ray Ryan in Revenue tells me that there will be more changes taking place if you're an Irish manufacturer exporting to the UK from um, July and September. And he there is a link to the uh, UK um, customs uh, people and they will be holding a series of webinars if you want more information on that. 
uh, we have uh, frequently asked questions on our website and we are currently updating our medical device one and the Department of Housing are very good frequently asked questions on their website. So this is the blue guide here for further information. If you want any information at all on the, uh, on the EU reg like regulations, I would suggest that you would look at this blue guide. I do believe it will be updated later on this year. So thank you all very much for your time and attention. And I'll hand you back over now to Gary. Thank you, Mary. Great stuff. Thanks a million for that. We do have some questions that have come in. And if there's any more guys, just use the question and answers function on the bottom of your page. So Mary, if an Irish company, for example, Precision Engineering or Plastics Moulder, who buys raw material from the UK stockists, such as steel or plastic, master batch, and then process it in Ireland into a sub-supply component, not end product, and ship back to the UK, do they need to worry about CE, UK, CA mark changes? For example, customers are in the med medical, aero, auto, energy, and industrial sectors, and the customers are located in Great Britain, Great Britain and Northern Ireland. Um, right, Gary, um, that's a lot there. Well, they only really need to worry about the CUK if, if a harmonized standard, harmonized or de designated standard applies to the product. So you should focus on the specific sector and guidance and identify this as soon as possible with the timetable. And you may need to consider, uh, there's other considerations. You may need to look at say the REACH directive the, for chemical control and classification packaging issues. Thank you very much. A uh, question from Paul, Agricult agricultural manufacturer currently self-certified for CE. Is this still self-certification -cert for UK? Uh, well, he would have to, if he, if he is placing his products on the UK market, UK rules apply. So he can, no problem, I'm sure, self-certifying, but the rules may be slightly different to what he may have experienced uh, under EU rules. Excellent. And that is uh, vice versa for a UK manufacturer going into the EU. And from Mike, uh, and possibly this was mentioned later on in the presentation, you mentioned UK AS certification at the start. Can you confirm if this certification is valid for Ireland and basically are UK AS accredited test results recognised in the EU? Um, now, what I mentioned earlier is that under the, uh, the 32 directives and regulations that I'd outlined, um, you must, uh, the, the rules state very clearly in 765 that you must use a harmonised standard. Now, UCAS test certs for, a, for the for directive, but not for uh, other other voluntary standards. Uh, though those test certs under 17025 would not be recognised, and they would have to be tested by an EU uh, test lab, uh, a UCAS test cert for say the construction products regulation for the machinery directive will have to have their products tested if it is working to a harmonised uh, standard. Okay. So that, that has to be very, very clear. Now, that is, that is not um, reciprocated at the moment in the UK. And that was a bit of a stumbling block in the trade negotiations. And I know there's a lot of concern because there's a lot of innovative products. So uh, the best people to answer that question uh, would be the people in the Department of Housing in terms of construction, but uh, for uh, construction products, because they have an awful lot of innovative products on the market uh, being placed on the, uh, say, the European and Irish market. And I would have also tell people to look up the FAQs under from the Department of Housing. Those questions are quite easily answered. Thank you. And for non-medical companies selling into the UK healthcare sector, where these companies have sourced the product from China into Great Britain, across to the Republic of Ireland, and then up to Northern Ireland, those acting as the marketed manufacturer, how will the UK CA mark impact them? Well, the rules to where the product is being placed on the market and not where and not where it is manufactured. That's the first thing. And when the product is destined for Northern Ireland market, um, then they would need to comply with the rules for placing the products in the Northern Ireland market. And that those rules would be EU rules. This means that under Article 5 of the Northern Ireland protocols, goods brought into Northern Ireland from outside the union shall be considered to be 
I would say at risk and subsequently moved into the union unless it meets the specific criteria. So EU uh, product legislation will apply and they will also meet, need to meet any UK or Northern Ireland requirements not covered by EU legislation. So it, it all depends on if the product is destined for the EU market, then you need an EU declaration of conformity. If a product is destined for the UK, you must then have a UK declaration of conformity and the manufacturer must have the product certified by both the EU body and by a UK approved body. So both the CE and UK CA mark can be fixed to the product. Thank you. A question from Nigel. While we are gearing up to be UK CA certified by the 1st of the 1st 22 as a manufactured product based on CE, what is the position for sub suppliers with UK CA branding? Firstly, for the production of goods and if supplying into the UK as spare parts. Uh, that's, a, that, that's a tricky one. Um, if the components, like it's the end product that matters uh, on placing the product in the market. So if the product is been certified uh, by an EU notified body, they would be looking at the manufacturer's technical file and the manufacturer and the, the notify body should be looking to see uh, where the product was tested. If it had been tested by a UK approved body and it is going, if, if it's going onto the European market, then it would have to have, like I said before, EU notify bodies uh, approval. If if in January, it, if, if the same product is going to your to the UK, then they will have to work to two pieces of legislation, both the UK, they'd have to have the UK CA mark and they'd have to have uh, the CE mark. So they will have to have two different types of tests. Now, you can see that there are 14 notified bodies in Ireland who can offer UK CA marking and CE marking. Um, I, there, at the moment, there is work going on in the background. There's nothing def definitive, but um, certainly uh, in terms of if we, if we in NSCI, if we were to set up in the UK to offer the UK CMR, we have to have a presence in the UK. Likewise, any note bought a UK approved body that came into Ireland to offer the CMR, they have to have a base here in Ireland. They comply to the EU rules. So those approved, but they, there are 14 notified bodies in Ireland who are both have foot in, in either camp, so they can offer a, a dual certification. Um, there is capacity issues at the moment, I think, with UCAS, with a lot of people applying to get UKCA marked. So I, I would advise people that they would need to be working on this now because I think things will be moving slower because there'll be a big demand for placing products maybe in the UK market. I hope that answers the question. Thank you. Um, a large amount of steel for the construction industry is purchased in Great Britain, brought to Ireland and manufactured for say residential developments and exported back to Great Britain. What is the process they need to do to ensure compliance? Well, the rules that apply are where the product is placed on the market, not where it is manufactured. So, um, are, are you saying that the products are coming from GB, just to, to say it again, they're coming from GB and they've been placed into the Irish market? The, yeah, so uh, it's regarding to large amounts of steel for the construction industry purchased in Great Britain, brought to Ireland and manufactured for, say, residential developments and then exported back to Great Britain. So the, they would have to ensure that they have to comply if, 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 they're, if the product the end product is going onto the UK market. It's it's where it's not where it's manufactured. It's where the product is going to be placed, and therefore you would have to apply to uh, EU rules and regulations. Oh, sorry, UK. I beg your pardon. UK <laughs> UK rules and regulations. My my apologies. Okay, uh, we are getting loads of questions in here. We're, we won't get to them all, but we will get back to you by email afterwards if we don't get your question. There's another one here from Alex. Do you need to be based in the UK to sign a UK CA declaration of conformity? Well, under uh, UK law, and, and it will be the same under EU law, uh, you have to have a base uh, in, in, in the UK. And that is why uh, and that is why so many of you sort of do the reverse. That is why where there were UK companies came to Ireland, 
the same rule because they wanted to issue the C mark. They had to have a legal entity in, in uh, Ireland or the EU. Likewise, if you are issuing the UKCA mark, you must be a legal entity. And it's the UCAS, the United Kingdom Accreditation Service, are the people that you would get further information on that. If you wish to become a UK approved body, you have to fill out the form Gen 5. Uh, which is downloaded from the UCAS uh, website. But certainly if you're issuing a UKCA mark, you have to be based in Great Britain. Okay. And with the UK presenting challenges to already agreed on protocols and possible threats to the single market, is there a risk the EU could trigger in the future some constraints on the free movement of goods from Ireland? And should we be worried? Well, I'm not a politician. And I'm not going to give a politician's answer. We've worked very, very hard, I think, on the protocol. There are 23 specialised uh, committees working between the EU and the UK. And Rome wasn't built in a day, and a trade agreement takes five years to build. And there's going to be bumps and rides in, in uh, teasing out the, ver the various issues, which have only really arisen since the 1st of January. And that was to be expected. I'm not surprised about it, but other people are. Like the delays of ports, uh, you, you're seeing that freight to mainland Europe is up 465%. Uh, freight to uh, Landbridge is down 51%. So there, there are a lot of uh, issues uh, that we are trying to work with. And in, in particular, um, the government, the Irish government have given additional resources, say to Revenue, Department of Agriculture, even to ourselves to uh, work uh, on say market surveillance work. So there is a drive that we'll have an all island economy and with as little disruption, but I can't have a crystal ball in front of me and look to the future and see what is going to happen. I would like to think that we can work through this because it's in everybody's interest. A huge thank you to Mary for that excellent and insightful explanation. If you have any questions on any of this, please email brexitunit at nsai.ie and for more videos from IMR, hit that subscribe button in the corner.